Dr. Gruber and team, are you ready? All virtually located elsewhere, but I, I'm ready. Can you hear me, by the way? I put on a headset in hopes that that helps with the audio. Can you hear me you're better? You're still a little – we can hear you okay, but you're still a little far away. You, you seem <laughs> um, closer and louder during the initial part of your presentations. Okay. Well, I'll try to speak up um, because I think this would help. Thank you. All okay. right. So we'll resume. Um, and liaisons, we will go as long as necessary to answer all your questions. Um, so uh, please, uh, Dr. Dries. Thank you, uh, Marcy Dries from Shea. So as we're beginning to, or we're preparing to begin vaccinating healthcare workers as early as next week, uh, we've discussed populations for whom we have no data, like pregnant women and immune compromised. But will there be any recommendations as to specific contraindications for this vaccine? Um, we're getting a lot of questions from those with a history of autoimmunity, for example. Um, I don't believe people with this history were excluded from the trial, but could you comment on that? And then as for allergy, how long would we be expected to monitor people post-vaccination? And would that differ between those who have a history of some sort of allergic reaction versus those that don't? Um, and then lastly, and I realize this may be more of a question for Dr. Fink, uh, would we expect to get the EUA fact sheet, which I assume would include some of this information, at the same time that an EUA is issued, or would there be a delay on that? Uh, thank you very much. Sounds to me actually maybe the first and the last question or a question for, for Dr. Fink. I, I think, as I've already stated, that we do not have data uh, in immunocompromised populations or uh, individuals uh, in pregnancy. Um, uh, and I know that negotiations are ongoing as far as the label is concerned, and I'm not the best person uh, to speak to that. As far as monitoring is concerned, that also is to some extent a lab, uh, labeling or a recommendation issue. I, I don't see from my perspective a reason that one would um, uh, you know, respond any differently to people uh, than we typically do in terms of having to monitor individuals in, in, a, uh, in a setting. As we said, we have um, within uh, um, many, if not most labels for vaccines, precautions around being prepared to deal with an allergic reaction if it occurs and monitoring individuals uh, for a period of time. Uh, but I, I, I defer to others that uh, have to make those recommendations and, and uh, you know, from a regulatory perspective, have to have that information in the label. Uh, hi, this is uh, Doran Fink. And uh, before I answer the question, I want to apologize. Uh, as you can imagine, it's very busy at, at FDA today and I've had to jump off uh, to uh, attend to, to several uh, urgent issues. And so if I missed any previous questions, um, I, I do apologize. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, authorized use and, and any contraindications, uh, the uh, VERPAC vote yesterday was for uh, an indication uh, for use in individuals ages 16 and over period. And that's what the, the committee voted on uh, any populations that uh, are not specifically contraindicated for use uh, would therefore be uh, included uh, in that, that indication. Um, we expect that uh, we will at least have a, a labeled contraindication uh, for use in individuals with any known allergy uh, to any of the components of the vaccine and, and the prescribing information and fact sheets will we'll make sure that those components uh, are described. Um, one of the things that we are discussing today is, is whether we would uh, need any additional uh, uh, warnings or, or precautions or other information in the fact sheets uh, related to these allergic reactions, uh, severe allergic reactions that have occurred uh, in, in the UK. Um, and certainly those uh, those data will, will also be described. Uh, fact sheets and prescribing information must be uh, provided with the, the, the vaccine um, uh, when made available under the EUA. And so uh, I don't uh, anticipate that there would be any delay with respect to that. Over. Thank you, Dr. Fink. And short of cloning yourself, we understand that uh, you need to go and attend to other business, and we're grateful that you're here for us. Um, Dr. McKinney, and please Thank lower you. your hands after you ask your question, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
Was the lymphadenopathy observed in the vaccine recipients regional at the site of injection only, or was it generalized? And was it uh, found to be transient or persistent in nature? And finally, was it present in those persons with appendicitis or Bell's palsy? Yeah, so let me let me maybe address the first two. I don't know that we've got an answer for the third one. Um, uh, the nature of the lymphadenopathy individuals were asked uh, or were vaccinated in, in the non-dominant arm. In the one uh, uh, related uh, or, or case that was considered related by the investigator, uh, that individual's lymphadenopathy was actually uh, found to be on the on the opposite uh, side. Uh, from the deltoid where the individual injected the, it was in the axilla on the other side. Um, I, others may be able to comment about the nature of the other lymphadenopathy. In, in uh, most all instances, it was transient. Um, and I think, um, again, either uh, Susan Mather or, or John Perez may be able to uh, comment on that. We do know, of course, that this exists uh, with other vaccine is in the label for other vaccines. Uh, sometimes it's picked up in the uh, in the uh, clinical trials and sometimes it's picked up after uh, approval. I think in our case, uh, one of the reasons we may have picked up this 0.3% uh, incidence that we've seen is because this is a huge uh, uh, database, right, of, of individuals uh, of which we have uh, 38,000 two months, a uh, uh, median follow-up time of, of two months. Uh, so it may well be that part of the reason we picked this up sooner than other trials where uh, data requirements sometimes uh, amount to having 3,000 vaccinated subjects for six months, uh, we have, if you will, more subject months of follow-up uh, than, than uh, typically would occur in, in that circumstance already. So I, I, I think uh, that may be one of the reasons. Now let me, let me uh, defer to uh, Susan Mather to see if she, uh, she has anything else she wants to say or if, uh, you can call on uh, John Perez if he has any other data. Hi, this is um, Dr. Trump. Um, the, the lymphadenopathy that we saw was was transient, tended to occur after uh, you know, five days or so, um, and um, generally where where it was reported, and we didn't have reports in all cases. Um, it was it's the lateral to the injection, so typically found in the axilla or in the neck. And I think and this is Susan Mather speaking. You asked about the about the presence of lymphadenopathy in the patients with facial paralysis, and no, um, there there was not um, any reported enlargement of lymph nodes in in those four patients, um, nor in the appendicitis patients. Um, no, because we looked closely to see if there was any mention of lymph nodes in surgical pathology reports or in any of the imaging studies. And there was there was not in the data that we received. Susan, you might just want to comment. I don't think I spoke to the uh, percentages that we've seen, um, uh, you know, in labels just to serve as a metric. And again, the committee members may be familiar with that, but maybe worthwhile just commenting on. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry I can't give you percentages, but I do know it, it's not. Um, you know, it, it is in, in other labels. I know it's in some um, meningitis vaccine labels. I think lymphadenopathy was traditionally seen a lot with BCG, um, but I, I I couldn't give you a percentage. I do apologize. Yeah, I think, and again, I mean, people can obviously look this up for themselves. My recollection from uh, some of the material that was prepared for us in preparation for Verpac is some say, something less than 1%. Uh, you know, I think there are some instances where maybe it's a little bit above 1%. Um, so I, it, it's my sense that we're not seeing anything that's dramatically different than, than vaccines for which this has been reported. Um, but that's, you know, again, people can look at the labels and, and judge for themselves. And although we identified the lymphadenopathy as an adverse reaction, the, the, the actual um, Frequency was, you know, 0.3 percent. So it wasn't, uh, it was not common. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Whitley Williams, please. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I, thank you for that terrific presentation, uh, and particularly thank you for sharing the data on the underrepresented minority populations. Um, the percent in African-Americans, I believe, was 9.6%. Uh, 
uh, at least in the vaccinated, roughly the same in the placebo group. Um, and if you look at the actual N, it's, it's pretty small. It's only 2,000. Um, however, I, you know, I applaud you, and I would just hope that as future trials, um, you know, continue, um, and certainly the follow-up, um, you know, that, that there be these underrepresented minority subjects be included in the follow-up. Um, the, if I look at the Latino and Hispanic, um, that was a much higher percentage, 26%. Um, so again, I applaud you for the efforts. Um, however, we will, you know, anything that was used, anything learned, lessons learned um, to increase the representation, particularly of African-Americans um, who truly are underrepresented um, in these trials. But, but I applaud you for including them and please include uh, tr you know, do your best to, to keep them enrolled in the uh, trial, at least for the follow-up. Thank you. Yeah, Tony, thank you for that comment. And obviously, we're very keen recognizing, as we uh, as we said, that uh, individual and uh, racial and ethnic minorities have a, a much greater risk. So that was very important for us to include them in the trial. We continue those efforts, and I, I'm sure that the, you know the observational studies that we talked about post licensure will you know, across populations, we'll be looking at those populations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Duchin. Thank you, Jeff Duchin, IDSA. A question about the anaphylaxis issue. Um, are there in the contraindication to, um, to, that will be issued for people with severe allergic reactions, um, are there any other products, medical products or other products that might have ingredients that are contained in this vaccine that people would not be aware of by looking at the chemical names of the vaccine ingredients? Yeah, that's, I, to, to me, that's, that's somewhat of a challenging question, right? I mean, the, the presumption, uh, I guess, would be that if you had uh, an anaphylactic reaction to something uh, like a product, uh, people would work hard to figure out what was in that product, and that person would know. Uh, you know, if they had a minor reaction, you know, maybe you wouldn't even investigate it. Uh, you know, but my hope would be that if you'd had true anaphylaxis or a severe reaction, uh, that there would be some investigation that would in, in, inform um, the individual. Did you think that there are other products that can that have common ingredients with your vaccine? Um, well, I, you know, I'll, there was a fair amount of discussion last night, I guess, uh, uh, amongst the CSIC group about this, and maybe I'll defer to Susan on it. We, we do know that this has polyethylene glycol uh, in it uh, as an excipient for which there has been some uh, history of some individuals. Again, it seems to be a, a rare phenomenon, but some individuals that have uh, specific allergic reactions to that uh, component. But I'll, I'm going to, maybe I can defer to uh, either others from the CDC that were involved in that discussion, or uh, other, uh, or, or Susan, you know, to you know, basically comment on that particular aspect. Sorry, I couldn't. I'm sorry, Susan. I couldn't get off mute fast enough. Um, I think Phil actually might be um, a better person to to answer that question. Yeah. I, I, I hate to turn it over to him, but he's much more knowledgeable on the lipids than I am. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to contribute. The most similar product uh, would be on Petra, um, which is also a lipid nanoparticle formulated so, um, RNA, a much smaller RNA, uh, and it's just followed with purine RNA. And of the four lipids in our formulation, uh, two uh, are the same, uh, cholesterol and BSPC. Uh, and the others, it, it has slightly different pegylated lipid and ionizable amino lipid. It has other molecules in those classes. Uh, so, so if we were to, uh, to look for the, the nearest uh, similar product, uh, that, that would be uh, the most similar licensed product. I'm really sorry. I couldn't hear you. I hope others could. Uh, but if no one could hear, maybe we could get that repeated. Otherwise, I'll ask my colleagues for what you said later. Uh, I, so this is Jose. I was able to understand it. Did, 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 does, the, does the committee voting members want the, the, the answer repeated? 
actually a repeat would be helpful. I, it cut out for me as well. Very good. Sure. Would you please? Sorry would you please? About, yeah, so sorry about the audio. Uh, so the most similar uh, product is, is on Patra, uh, which is also a lipid nanoparticle formulated RNA product. Uh, it is a, a small RNA, uh, a small endocrine RNA. And of the four lipids, two are the same, of uh, cholesterol and DSPC, and two are different but similar. Uh, a pegylated lipid and an ionizable uh, amino lipid. Um, so, so that that's the closest uh, we have for a similar product. Thank you for repeating that. Um, so, uh, Dr. Maldonado. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Bonnie Maldonado, American Academy of Pediatrics. So, thank you, Bill Gruber, for that presentation. Um, I, I think they, excuse me. <clears throat> um, the issue around 16 to 17 year olds has been quite uh, important, as you obviously know from yesterday's FDA vote, VERPAC vote, it came up quite a bit, uh, especially among the pediatricians. I want to be sure that this is not something that holds up um, the rest of um, the world from being vaccinated. And I also don't want this to be a, an obstacle to us vaccinating children. So I would like to hear a little bit more about your plan. Um, you did mention that you were going to pursue uh, vaccinating pediatric trials. So can you give us a little more de detail, obviously not super granular, but you know, what exactly will be the next steps? Is this going to happen right now? Are you moving to younger age groups pretty quickly? Um, and, and separately, there will be policy implications, obviously, because of the equity issues around young frontline workers um, who are under 18 who might otherwise qualify for dosing. And I think uh, uh, to Dr. Williams' uh, point, um, confidence in a vaccine like this for people who are already disenfranchised and maybe frontline and who are also pediatric patients as well, I think will be critically important for updates. So any granularity you can give us around how you plan to move <laughs> forward in these pediatric trials in the immediate future would be really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, as I said, we, we consider the pediatric populations as, as, as very important. We obviously have requirements, uh, but beyond the requirements, we recognize uh, that although disease does appear to be less frequent, particularly for those as you move down in the younger age groups. Nonetheless, we do have hospitalizations across the country. We have yet, I think, to fully define the potential for spread uh, from those uh, populations. And obviously, uh, we want to keep our schools open and children engaged. Um, and so right now, um, we have included information in the current file for 16 to 17 year olds, um, and we're continuing to enrich that database. We will uh, have uh, individuals that are not part of the current EUA filing, and we use that data in part to help support um, uh, the older age group, and, uh, but these are the 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, those are being actively enrolled. Um, I think, uh, you know, we are, uh, as I said, we had a, a cohort of about 100. I think we're now up above 500 uh, in, towards our goal uh, of enrolling a total of 2,000. It's our intent uh, to essentially have the appropriate sort of safety and immunogenicity proximate to the time uh, that we would file the BLA and potentially be able to get uh, uh, you know, an indication in that age group. Um, and then once we have that data, uh, you know, I, I consider it very fortunate, and I mentioned this yesterday at VRPAC, uh, you know, I actually had anticipated that maybe we would have reached the threshold, and as we got down into the 12 to 15 year old age group, maybe we would see more reactogenicity. But as you heard from Dr. Perez, we actually have been comforted and reassured uh, that uh, it doesn't seem to be noticeably different than what we've seen in 18 to 25 year olds. Uh, and so we've continued at the 30 microgram dose for the uh, planned enrollment or the full 2000. But we may not be so lucky when we move down into the younger age groups, five to 11. So right now, our plan is to a dose, uh, do a dose ranging study uh, in that uh, population. Uh, predicated on what we've learned in the 12 to 15 year olds, um, and uh, and then gradually move down from there. It's anticipated that we would likely be starting that trial 
uh, in the April time frame. Uh, that gives us enough time to obviously have done what we needed to do in the 12 to 15 year olds so to obviously put that in front of uh, the FDA and other regulatory authorities. Uh, so I, again, imagine a dose ranging study. Uh, that's what we're uh, moving forward with in our thinking for the five to 11 year olds. And then once we have that in hand, uh, moving down to the youngest age groups, uh, younger than five. Um, and so, uh, you know, proceeding, you know, I think as rapidly, but as judiciously as uh, we can guided by um, uh, the information that we're gaining. The other piece to this, of course, uh, the dose ranging is not just for the reactogenicity part. Uh, our plan is because we're, we're not, you know, convinced we may be, you know, may actually see an attack rate in the uh, 12 to 15 year olds that gives us some information about efficacy. But our plan right now is is under the presumption that we won't have enough cases. And in that circumstance, we do immunobridging. So, um, that would be the other piece of data once we have that and, and, and can be confident, yeah, 30 micrograms behaves similarly or perhaps even better than it does in older individuals. That will further inform what we do in the uh, five to 11 year olds and then the younger than fives. Great, thank you. Forgive me, I couldn't get off uh, mute. Um, uh, Dr. Paling, please, you had a question you wanted to ask and that will yeah. be our last question for this session. And then we will move on to uh, grade. There's plenty of time after grade uh, to, uh, to ask further questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about Bell's palsy. I think we briefly alluded it to it. And I believe there were more cases in the vaccine group than the placebo group. Could you share the time frame between um, the vaccine dose and the development of Bell's palsy? Please, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to turn back to uh, Drs. Perez and Mather. Obviously, we paid attention to this just like the FDA has uh, to make sure that we could be confident that there is not uh, a signal there. I can say at the outset that the, the frequency of what was seen in terms of the overall trial was well within the range of what we might expect looking at the population at large. Um, and of course, you know, given that, uh, you know, four cases, uh, you know, uh, you would expect one sixteenth of the time uh, to actually have them appear in that distribution if the vaccine wasn't related. So, um, but maybe I could turn to uh, uh, Dr. Mather and Dr. Perez. Sure. Uh, um, is... doc... Oh, sorry. Sorry, John. Okay, so there were four cases of facial paralysis reported in the vaccine group. In the first subject, the facial paralysis occurred three days later after their first dose and uh, resolved three days after that. The second subject uh, developed facial paralysis nine days after vaccination. The third subject developed facial paralysis. Uh, one second. 48 days after? 48 days, yes, 40, thank you, 48 <laughs> days. And the fourth person developed it 37 days after right. vaccination. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez, do you wish to ask a question? Don't hear that. Um, I see Dr. Uh, McMullen's hand on. What we're going to do, Dr. McMullen, um, is we're going to move on to grade and then we'll allow you to ask your questions afterwards so we can get uh, through that part of our, of our day, if you don't mind. So um, let me thank uh, Dr. Gruber and his team uh, for answering our questions, um, and uh, thank you very, very much. And so we're going to move on to our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Garano, uh, will, who will talk about uh, GRADE, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Julia Gargano, and I will be sharing the GRADE evaluation for the Pfizer vaccine. Next slide, please. The policy question under consideration is, should vaccination with Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine be recommended for persons 16 years of age and older under an emergency use authorization? Next. The components of the PICO question are shown on this slide. The population under consideration is persons aged 16 years and older, 
The intervention is two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine 21 days apart. The comparison is no vaccine. The work group identified the seven outcomes listed here as the most important for the policy question. Next, please. The potential benefits outlined in red included prevention of symptomatic COVID-19 and hospitalization due to COVID-19, which were both considered critical outcomes, and all-cause death, SARS-CoV-2 seroconversion, and asymptomatic infection identified as important. Next. The two harms identified were serious adverse events, a critical outcome, and reactogenicity grade three or four, an important outcome. Next. Of note, in the case of these vaccine trials, hospitalization due to COVID-19 and death are less common and the phase three trials may not be designed or powered to evaluate differences between treatment groups. We do not necessarily expect to have direct evidence for these outcomes at this point, and to some, some degree, we can infer that decreases in symptomatic COVID-19 would also translate into decreases in hospitalizations and death, as has been observed for other vaccines. Next. And additionally, for the outcomes of seroconversion and asymptomatic infection, no data are currently available. So these outcomes are not included in the evidence profile I'm going to present. Data on seroconversion will eventually be available in an ongoing phase three trial, but asymptomatic infection is not currently being studied. However, the work group did consider it an important outcome. Next. We conducted a systematic review to identify evidence related to the policy question. We identified published articles using the databases and search terms listed here to identify data on vaccination with the specific vaccine formulation under consideration that involved human subjects, reported primary data, included adults at risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection, included data relevant to the efficacy and safety outcomes being measured, and included data on the dose and timing under consideration. We sought out additional resources, including obtaining unpublished data from vaccine manufacturers. Next. Next slide, please. Briefly, over 2,700 records were identified through database searching, and one record was obtained directly from the sponsor of the Phase 2-3 trial. Ultimately, two resources were included in the evidence synthesis. Next. Grade evidence type assesses the certainty of estimates from the available data. The highest level of certainty is type 1, which means we are very confident the true effect lies close to that of the estimate. Type two means we are modestly confident in the effect estimate, but there is a possibility the true effect could be substantially different. Type three, low certainty, indicates our confidence in the effect estimate is limited, and type four indicates very low certainty, meaning we have little confidence in the effect estimate. The evidence type is not measuring the quality of individual studies, but how much certainty we have in the quantitative estimates of effects for each outcome. Next, please. Additional evidence type is determined by the study design. A body of evidence from randomized controlled trials starts with an initial evidence type of one, indicating high certainty. A body of evidence from observational studies would start with an evidence type of three, indicating low certainty. The evidence type can be downgraded due to risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, or imprecision. Other considerations could downgrade or upgrade the evidence type. Next. Now I'm going to review the benefits. Next, please. For the critical outcome of symptomatic COVID-19, one study provided data. This was the Pfizer-BioNTech Phase 2-3 randomized controlled trial, and the data were obtained directly from the sponsor. The data cutoff date was November 14, 2020. Next. Primary analyses were performed for an evaluable efficacy population defined as all eligible randomized participants who received all vaccinations as randomized within the predefined window and have no other important protocol deviations as determined by the clinician. Um, and these persons also did not have any evidence of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection. For these analyses, there were over 36,000 persons, about 18,000 per arm, who contributed over 4,000 person years of observation about 2,200 per arm. Some secondary analyses included persons with prior infection, and there were about 4,000 persons and 4,600 total person years of observation for these. Analyses were also done for an all-available efficacy population 
which includes all randomized participants who received at least one dose with outcome counting any time after that. The number of persons is a bit larger, over 43,000, um, but the number of person years is quite a bit larger, almost 8,000 or 4,000 person years per arm. It may be helpful to think of the evaluable efficacy population as similar to a per protocol analysis and the all available efficacy as more similar to an intention to treat analysis. Next slide. So using the available efficacy population for all persons aged at least 16 years, there were eight cases among 17,411 persons in the vaccine arm and 162 cases among 17,511 persons in the placebo arm, which resulted in a vaccine efficacy estimate of 95% and a 95% confidence interval of 90.3% to 97.6%. This is the outcome used for grade. Next. Vaccine efficacy was also over 90% in a number of key subgroups, including those aged 65 and older, 75 and older, those at risk due to presence of a comorbidity or obesity, and those who were aged at least 65 years and at risk. For some subgroups, the number of person years uh, of observation was small and the confidence intervals were uh, considerably wider. Next slide. This si slide shows a comparison of primary and secondary outcomes. Varying the timing of outcome assessment and with the inclusion of persons who had evidence of prior infection um, shown in the section outlined in red, um, had little influence on the efficacy estimates. Next slide. The last line in this table shows the results of the all available efficacy population, which includes everyone who received at least one dose of vaccine or placebo. There were 50 cases reported among 21,314 persons who received the vaccine and 275 cases among 21,258 persons who received the placebo for a vaccine efficacy estimate of 82% and a 95% confidence interval of 75.6% to 86.9%. Next. Here's the grade evidence table for the outcome symptomatic COVID-19. Because the data were from a randomized controlled trial, the evidence type started at one. Regarding risk of bias, there was some concern related to blinding. Participants and study staff were blinded to assignments, but they may have inferred receipt of vaccine or placebo assignment um, based on reactogenicity. This was deemed unlikely to overestimate the efficacy result. There were, therefore, we considered the risk of bias not serious. Because there was only one study, uh, there were no serious concerns of inconsistency. Some concern for indirectness to outcome was noted uh, due to the short duration of observation in the available body of evidence. The vaccine efficacy observed at median two-month follow-up may differ from the efficacy observed with ongoing follow-up. However, in consideration of the strength of association and precision observed for this outcome in particular, it is unlikely that the efficacy estimate for symptomatic COVID-19 would change substantially enough to fall below the FDA-defined efficacy threshold for, life, for uh, use under an emergency use authorization, that is under 50% efficacy. We also um, acknowledge some concern for indirectness to population because of exclusions from the clinical trial. We judge this to be not serious, in part because all available subgroup evaluations were so consistent. The rel relative effect was very strong, as indicated by the VE estimate of 95% with a narrow confidence interval. There were no other serious concerns affecting the certainty assessment. We assess the level of certainty as high or type 1 for this critical outcome. Next, the second outcome for consideration was hospitalization for COVID-19. The protocol included a definition of severe COVID-19 with criteria shown here on this slide, but this did not require hospitalization. We have obtained data on hospitalization from the sponsor. Next slide. This slide shows um, four analyses two which use analyses from the um, available efficacy population, which are in the top two rows, and these correspond with the population used for the primary efficacy analyses for symptomatic COVID. The parallel analyses using all available efficacy population are in the bottom two rows. We are showing the severe COVID-19 outcome as defined in the phase two, three protocol, as well as the hospitalization outcome per the PICO question. The analysis outlined in red is the one used in grade. 
there were five cases of COVID resulting in hospitalization that occurred, that occurred at least seven days post-dose two among persons who did not have evidence of prior infection, all in the placebo group. The vaccine efficacy was 100% and the 95% confidence interval did include the null value. Note that the analyses in the all available efficacy population included more than twice as many events and the confidence intervals show statistical significance. Next slide. Okay, here is the grade evidence table for hospitalization for COVID-19. The initial evidence type was of one was downgraded one point due to serious concern over indirectness of outcome because of the short duration of follow-up. COVID-19 leading to hospitalization measured in such a short time frame is an indirect measure and some hospitalizations may not have occurred yet for some cases included in the analysis. Certainty was also downgraded one point for imprecision. The final certainty estimate for the outcome of hospitalization for COVID-19 is type three. Next, please. The next outcome of interest was all cause death, which the sponsor regarded as descriptive only. This was not an efficacy endpoint in the trial protocol. Next. There were few deaths among trial participants, in including two among vaccinated persons and four among placebo uh, persons in the placebo group. No person time analysis of deaths was available. The available data indicates a relative risk of death of 0.5 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.09 to 2.73. Next. The grade evidence table for all-cause death is shown here. There was no serious risk of bias identified and no serious concern of inconsistency. There was serious concern for indirectness due to the short duration of follow-up. Deaths due to COVID-19 may not have had time to occur during the follow-up period, follow period. There was very serious concern of imprecision. The relative risk of 0.5 favored vaccination, but the very wide 95% confidence interval did not rule out harms. The certainty estimate was type four. Next. Okay, I'm going to share the grade on harms. Next. Two studies provided data on harms. These included the phase two, three trial, as well as a published phase one trial. Next. The phase one study by Walsh included data on adults aged 18 to 55 and 65 to 85 years, including 12 who were vaccinated with the relevant dose and nine who received placebo in each age group. We evaluated the safety data from this study, including local and systemic reactions and serious adverse events. Next. Here are the raw data for the critical outcome serious adverse events. From the phase one trial, there was one serious adverse event identified in the vaccinated group unrelated to vaccination and zero in the placebo group. In the phase three trial, there were 126 events among the vaccine group and 111 among the placebo group. FDA classified two serious adverse events as related to vaccination, a shoulder injury and lymphadenopathy. Next. Okay. The grade evidence table for serious adverse events is shown here. There was a balance of serious adverse events reported between vaccinated and placebo groups with a relative risk of 1.14 and a 95% confidence interval of 0.89 to 1.47. The certainty assessment was reduced one point due to serious concern of indirectness of outcome because the body of evidence does not provide certainty that rare serious adverse events were captured due to the short follow-up. So the final certainty was type two. Next. Reactogenicity was evaluated using the same two studies. The phase three trial did not solicit this data on everyone, but on a subset of over 8,000 participants. Next. Both, both Pfizer studies use the same events and grading scales shown here. The local reactions solicited for the seven days following vaccination were injection site pain, redness, and swelling. And the systemic events solicited were fever, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, fatigue, chills, new or worsened muscle pain, and new or worsened joint pain. Next. In the phase one study, grade three local reactions or systemic events were reported in 8.3% of persons in the vaccine arm and 5.6% of persons in the placebo arm. 
In the phase three study, grade three events were reported by 8.8% of persons in the vaccine arm and 2.1% of persons in the placebo arm. Next. Pooling the data from the two trials, we estimated the relative risk for any grade three or four event was 4.27 with a 95% confidence interval from 3.39 to 5.38. There was no serious concern for risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, or imprecision. The final certainty was type one. Next slide. This table summarizes our current grade assessment for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. In terms of benefits, the available data indicate that the vaccine is effective for preventing symptomatic COVID-19 with an evidence type of one. For hospitalization and death, the available evidence favors the intervention, but because so few events were observed during the median two-month follow-up, the certainty is lower with evidence types three and four, respectively. No data were available to assess the other two potential benefits. In terms of harms, the available data indicate that serious adverse events were balanced between the vaccine and placebo arms, and two serious adverse events were judged to be related to vaccination among over 21,000 persons vaccinated. Severe reactions were more common in vaccinated persons and about 8.8% of vaccine recipients versus 2.1% of placebo recipients reported grade three or four reactions. The evidence type for reactogenicity was type one. Next slide. I want to provide a few words of context for the grade. First, I want to reiterate that the policy question focuses on what will be an interim recommendation issued during an emergency use authorization. Regarding benefits, the phase three trial is ongoing and effect estimates may change with additional follow-up. This raised concern for indirectness of outcome as ideally we would like to observe efficacy over a period longer than two months. We judged that it is unlikely that the efficacy estimate for symptomatic COVID-19 would change substantially enough in the months following vaccination to fall below the FDA defined efficacy threshold for an EUA. Direct evidence of efficacy for hospitalization and death is limited at this time due to the small number of events that had been observed through November 14th. From the efficacy against symptomatic disease, we infer that vaccination would also reduce hospitalizations and deaths. No data were available to assess prevention of asymptomatic infections at this time. Regarding harms, grade three reactions were not uncommon in vaccinated persons. Serious adverse events occurred at a similar frequency in vaccine and placebo groups, but only two serious adverse events were associated with vaccination. Next. Uh, this, con this concludes the grade assessment. I would like to acknowledge the contributions of everyone listed on this slide in particular, Drs. Curran and Wallace, who have been instrumental in reviewing all available data in detail and preparing the grade assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Gargano. Um, let me ask uh, Dr. Cohn a question. Uh, Dr. Cohn, uh, shall we ask for questions from the voting members or? Um, we want to move on to Dr. Oliver's uh, presentation. This is Dr. Oliver. I think if voting members have questions specifically about the grade uh, presentation, we could take them now. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. Um, so um, let me go back here. Um, Dr. McMullen, I cut you off uh, at, at the last session because you had a question to ask. Do you still wish to ask that question? Um, thanks, Dr. Romero. I, I believe uh, this is Sharon McMullen for the American College Health Association. Um, I believe Dr. Gargano answered the question that I had for the Pfizer team, which was, will this vaccine prevent infection and disease or disease only? And the great presentation, I believe that, do I understand correctly that because no data of asymptomatic infection was included, we don't know if the Pfizer vaccine prevents transmission. That's correct. We have no data to inform that. Very good. Thank, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, please. And thank you for that excellent presentation, as always. It's um, a, a terrific summary of uh, and review of the data that we just looked at together. You know, my question actually relates to, to a process issue. Um, so it's interesting. The, the way this is framed, and I just want to confirm, is this is... Um, 
for the period of the EUA. Um, am I to infer that there would be a, a like another grade assessment at the time of licensure where this could be reevaluated? This is Dr. Oliver. I'll take that. Yes, that is that is our assumption that there will be an additional review of the evidence uh, when an additional um, data is available, including for a BLA. Thank you. And then may I just um, ask what the anticipated interval would be between an EUA and a BLA? And I realize it's nearly impossible to answer, but I think it would help me when thinking about um, sort of the, the durability of this uh, grade. Dr. Fink, do you happen to be on <laughs> and listening? Uh, I heard my name. Uh, it, could you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Dr. Fink. The question was uh, the time period between EUA and BLA. That uh, will depend on uh, the, the timeline for additional data to be collected, uh, mainly in terms of uh, additional safety follow-up, uh, both in clinical studies uh, and also uh, with use under EUA, um, as well as additional uh, data that would uh, inform uh, certain aspects of, of vaccine effectiveness. Um, I, I can't give you a, a specific time frame, but, but we'll say that uh, we are working with uh, the manufacturer uh, to uh, get to a, a biologic license uh, as quickly as, as possible and as soon as the data would support doing so. Thank you so much, Dr. Fink. Are there any other questions from the voting members? Any questions from the liaison? I see none. All right. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Garano for that uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, let's go on to uh, Dr. Oliver for work group uh, interpretation and next step discussion. All right, thanks so much and good afternoon. Next slide. So first, uh, for workgroup interpretations and a summary of the clinical trial data. Next slide. The workgroup reviewed the safety data from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Local reactions occurring within seven days were common. Pain at the injection site was the most common reported. Systemic reactions within seven days were common as well, with fatigue, headache, and muscle pain as the most common reported. S symptom onset was usually one to two days post-vaccine receipt, and most symptoms resolved with a median of one day. Next slide. So this slide highlights select local reactions by dose in two different populations. The top box is persons aged 16 to 55 years, and the lower box is persons over 55 years of age. You can see that 70 to 80% of participants had pain at the injection site after each dose of vaccine. And while a majority of older adults still had pain at the injection site, the proportion was slightly lower. Next slide. So this slide shows select systemic reactions in the younger and older populations. The top row of fever shows any fever over 38 degrees Celsius. Nearly 16% of persons 16 to 55 years of age had a fever after the second dose. This proportion is slightly lower among adults older than 55 years of age. We plan on having a document summarizing this reactogenicity data after each dose on the CDC and ACIP website to help inform providers and patients about possible expected symptoms post-vaccination. Next slide. So there were a few other events discussed among the work group to highlight. Lymphadenopathy had a higher frequency in the vaccine group compared to the placebo group. As localized lymph nodes are involved in the vaccine response, it is plausible that this could be related to vaccine. 
an occurrence of Bell's palsy was also noted with higher frequency in the vaccine group compared to placebo. The incidence within the vaccine group was consistent with the expected population rates. There is no known or expected causal relationship between the vaccine and Bell's palsy known at this time. And overall, serious adverse events were similar between the vaccine and placebo, placebo groups. Next slide. Efficacy data was reviewed by the work group as well. The primary efficacy endpoint, which was subjects without prior infection beginning seven days after the second dose, yielded an efficacy of 95%. High efficacy was noted for additional post hoc efficacy analyses, including those with evidence of prior infection across age, sex, race, and ethnicity categories, and those with underlying medical conditions. For example, the efficacy among adults 65 and older was 94.7%. Most recipients in the trial received two doses of the vaccine. However, an efficacy of 52.4% was noted between dose one and dose two. Next slide. Okay. Efficacy was noted against severe disease as well, although the confidence intervals are quite wide. Efficacy using two different definitions of severe disease was measured. First, an FDA definition with clinical symptoms listed at the bottom of this slide. And there was an additional analysis using a CDC definition with hospitalization, admission to an ICU, intubation or mechanical ventilation, or death, both showed sufficient efficacy, but with small numbers and wide confidence intervals. The phase three trial overall was not powered to assess efficacy of the vaccine to prevent hospitalization and death. Next slide. So overall, the work group discussed several aspects of the phase three safety and efficacy data. Communication around expected local and systemic reactions after vaccine receipt will be important. Post-authorization safety and effectiveness studies will be critical as well. Specifically, surveillance for Bell's palsy could help determine any possible causal relationship. A high efficacy among adults 65 and over is reassuring, and continued studies are needed to assess the duration of protection. Additional studies are also needed to assess the impact of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine on viral shedding and transmission. Next slide. Next slide. So we'd previously presented an overall presentation to ACIP of the evidence to recommendation framework without characteristics for a specific vaccine. We'd not previously presented judgments on the benefits and harms domain as the phase three trial data was needed to complete that assessment. Today, we'll present the work group's thoughts on these benefits and harms domain after reviewing this data and at the time of the next ACIP meeting, we'll present the full ETR framework for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Next slide. The first criterion for the benefits and harms domain is the magnitude of desirable anticipated effects, specifically how substantial is the anticipated effect for each main outcome for which there is a desirable effect. The work group felt that the anticipated desired effects were large. Next slide. The second criteria was the magnitude of undesirable anticipated effects, specifically how substantial are the anticipated um, undesirable effects for each main outcome. The work group felt that the undesirable anticipated effects were small. Next slide. The third criterion is the balance of the desirable and undesirable anticipated effects. Specifically, what is the balance between the desirable effects relative to the undesirable effects? The work group felt that this balance of effects favored the intervention, at this time the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Again, a full ETR presentation will follow the next time we meet. Next slide. Next slide. So first we wanted to bring up a specific safety issue that's been raised recently Issues of anaphylaxis or an anaphylactoid reaction 
were noted in UK recipients. Two healthcare workers with a history of severe allergic reactions, first to eggs and other food items, and the second to a drug. A third healthcare worker with no history of allergies developed tachycardia. CDC is following along with the public health authorities in England to understand these cases. Last night, CDC convened an external group with experiences in vaccine safety, immunology, and allergy to collate expert knowledge regarding possible cases. The FDA is obtaining more data from the UK regulatory authorities and will consider if additional information would need to be included in an EUA regarding this issue. We anticipate further information and clinical considerations to come around this issue prior to vaccine use in the US, and we'll discuss this again with ACIP once FDA has issued a decision on the Pfizer vaccine. Next slide. This issue, though, emphasizes the importance of having close safety surveillance. I want to briefly highlight the COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Technical Subgroup, or VAST. This group was built off of lessons learned from H1N1 vaccine safety monitoring. VAST will ensure transparency and independence regarding safety surveillance. The composition is listed here with co-chairs from ACIP and INVAC, with both ACIP and INVAC representation among membership. There will be independent expert consultants ex officio members, liaisons, and CDC co-leads. Next slide. The objectives for VAST are listed here. First, to review, evaluate, and interpret post-authorization COVID-19 vaccine safety data. To serve as a central hub for technical subject matter experts from federal agencies conducting safety monitoring. To advise ACIP on analyses interpretation and data presentations, and to liaise with the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup on issues of safety data through presentations to ACIP and the application of safety data to policy decisions. Currently, they're meeting weekly to refine procedures and hear updates on monitoring systems and plan to include periodic safety data summaries to the COVID Vaccine Workgroup and to ACIP. Next slide. So this slide was shown previously and highlights the many sy sy um, systems conducting safety surveillance monitoring and the timeline. Next slide. So for next steps, next slide. We await final decision from FDA regarding the issuance of an EUA. After an FDA decision, ACIP will have an emergency meeting. The full evidence to recommendation framework will be presented at that time. In addition, at that meeting, there will be a presentation for various clinical considerations where we'll present draft considerations for dosing intervals, co-administration with other vaccines, and vaccination of special populations, including those with immunodeficiencies and pregnant women. And finally, at that meeting, there'll be a vote on the recommendation for Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide. So we'll open up this now to ACIP discussion, focusing on the safety and efficacy data of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. I've placed the final benefits and harms question on this slide to determine if ACIP agrees with the work group interpretation on the balance between the desirable effects relative to the undesirable effects of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Thanks. Thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Dr. Oliver. So um, we will open it up for discussion. Uh, and um, maybe you should leave the last slide up before your thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm going to invite the voting members uh, to offer comment um, at this time. So um, I will take Chairman's prerogative and go first. Um, I think that based on uh, the data that has been presented for uh, today, I think overall, yes. I, I think that the, the desirable uh, effects um, are in favor uh, over the undesirable effects. Um, I still have some doubt, uh, or not doubt, uh, I'm still a little bit weary about 
the younger uh, age group, um, at uh, 16, 17 year old age group. Although I feel better today um, than I did coming uh, into the meeting um, from what has been said. But uh, otherwise, overall, I think the data uh, supports uh, that particular question. Uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. I'll just, you know, to answer the question, you know, I believe the efficacy of this vaccine is substantial. Um, and while there are some uh, uh, side effects from the vaccine, we should anticipate those side effects. And in terms of the balance uh, of the benefits versus the risks, in my mind, clearly the benefits far outweigh the risks that we're seeing right now. Um, one thing I did want to go back to um, relates to my prior question about grade and process. And I just want to clarify my question. Um, I am comfortable with the uh, level one for symptomatic uh, prevention of symptomatic disease um, and have no doubts that the efficacy is extremely high and much higher than I actually originally anticipated would be uh, prior to hearing about the data. Um, so very uh, uh, yeah, reassured by that. But just in terms of durability of immunity, I mean, I, I want to just recognize that during this EUA period and recognizing we will have a chance to re-review the data prior to licensure, um, that I am comfortable with a level one uh, in this context under the assumption that it would be, you know, three to six months uh, during this EUA period. I don't know what the actual interval would be. I think if the interval was anticipated to be a year or more out, I might feel differently about the level of certainty of that um, efficacy over that period of time. But again, during this period of the EUA, and again, making an assumption <laughs> that it'll be on the order of months and not years, uh, I would feel comfortable with that. But I did want to state that just for the record, because I think it's um, an important and unusual issue in grade that we don't typically encounter, uh, but, but notable for me, at least in this instance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Dr. Paling. Um, yes, thank you for a great and clear presentation. I'm going to um, agree with you. And going back to what Dr. Bell uh, reminded us earlier, during the three and three quarter hours that we've been working, um, roughly we'd estimate 450 people have died. And so um, the desirable effects do, in my opinion, um, outweigh the undesirable effects. We do know because the vaccine is immunogenic, it is also reactogenic. Um, I uh, initially, like Dr. Romero, had questions about the children um, and the number that were included in 16 to 17. But as I've looked it up, um, 154 children have died so far of COVID-19. That exceeds what happens in most influenza uh, epidemics. Um, and so I think that's important. Where um, I do, um, the importance of following up this data is really important. I appreciate the vast and all the post-marketing because I do think it'll be important to follow and continue close monitoring. That will conclude. Over. Thank you. Dr. Bell. Uh, thank you. Um, at the risk of exploring the obvious, um, I just wanted to... Um, Again, um, reiterate that while I think you know the answer to this question is a resounding yes in this context, that it is the context of a pandemic and of an emergency use authorization, and that there are a lot of um, questions remaining um, that you know, where we have really no information, no data um, about important questions like as Dr. Lee is mentioning the durability of protection, but also various subgroups and. Of course, our um, lack of data is amplified by the fact that it's, this, is a rel this is a new vaccine platform, so we really don't have any basis um, for extrapolating. So this is just all by way of saying um, the, that it's been very important for us to continue um, to accumulate the kind of data that we will need in order to be able to make longer-term recommendations based on and, and fill all of these data gaps that um, we've identified. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to um, suggest that I uh, concur with what you said earlier, Dr. Romero, that uh, it's, I, I'm concerned about the 16 to 17 year olds uh, 
some I, I absolutely would not want this to, uh, uh, I want this vaccine to be uh, available as soon as possible and get into as many arms. But I feel the data are limited for these 16 to 17 year olds. And I don't feel the same sense of urgency for the 16 to 17 year olds as, uh, as I do for the uh, other groups, healthcare personnel, people of color, 65 and uh, older, who are disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID-19. And my concern also extends that I would not want there to be an adverse event uh, that happens in this uh, younger age group that in turn would only magnify vaccine hesitancy amongst families. So I, I just wanted to go on record as uh, saying that. Thank you. Dr. Ault. I concur with what's being said, but I have a question. Do we have a guess about how many people, as far as essential workers, healthcare workers, might be 16 and 17? Is it a very large number? I mean, we have a guess about how many women are pregnant or lactating. Is there an intelligent guess we can make about 16 and 17 year olds in that group? Dr. Oliver or anybody else care to weigh in on that before we go to the next question? This is Dr. Oliver. I don't know that we have an exact estimate. We do anticipate that um, that there could be some in the 16 and 17 year old category that could um, be healthcare personnel or working at a long term care facility, um, and then you know could be essential workers as well. But I don't have an exact estimate on that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ralph. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Kimberlin, please. Uh, David Kimberlin, uh, AAP Red Book. I'm speaking really just on my own here, not not on behalf of the AAP. Um, but but I'll I'll kind of reiterate what what I think I heard Dr. Maldonado say earlier, and that's that for the 16 and 17 year olds, you know, there 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 potentially are, as Dr. Alt's question sort of um, would 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 make us. Think about there could be equity issues here, and, and biologically, uh, I, I think of a 17-year-old is not different from an 18-year-old. Uh, and so, since the trial enrolled 16 and over, and since the totality of the evidence looks so so strikingly positive, I personally would favor inclusion of 16 and 17-year-olds. Uh, in recommendations, it, recognizing that it's not recommending that all 16 and 17 year olds get vaccinated, but as their groups come up, so to speak, uh, through the phased um, uh, allocation of, of hopefully an increasing amount of vaccine, that they wouldn't be excluded. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Kimberlin. Dr. Hunter. Hi, thanks. I just wanted to express my support for um, the fact that the balance between desirable effects relative to the undesirable effects for this vaccine are very clear. And I think, especially as Dr. Paling and Dr. Bell um, mentioned in the context of the pandemic, that's true. And um, just as a comment, I wanted to um, really remember our neighbors, coworkers, friends, and family members who have uh, suffered from or are suffering from this disease or have died from it. And I wanted to honor the healthcare workers who are working very, very hard to combat those people who are ill and especially to support the public health uh, professionals who are working to prevent further cases. And I just wanted to express my deep gratitude for all those people. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, Dr. O'Leary. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I was just going to uh, follow up on Dr. Kimberlin's points. I, I agree with the point he made. And I also want to point out that um, while, of course, we want to make the recommendations for um, vaccination to protect individuals and those at highest risk of severe disease, um, it, it's also true that a lot of the considerations regarding the phases of allocation also consider um, the, the multiplier effects. And given that uh, younger adults are, are including older adolescents, older teens are among the highest um, groups in terms of incidence of disease, 
if they are working in those settings, healthcare settings, grocery stores, et cetera, um, it, it's going to be important to protect them, a 16-year-old, just as much as it's important to protect an 18-year-old. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Shlaji. Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Um, I actually was, uh, first of all, I definitely favor the balance towards to uh, desirable effects, uh, a remarkable balance to the desirable effects to this vaccine. And I was going to say uh, essentially what Dr. Kimberlin and, and Dr. O'Leary said. To me, I was, um, uh, it, it, it seems to me that both from an efficacy, from thinking about efficacy and certainly thinking about safety, I'm having a hard time um, coming up with a reason why 16 and 17 year olds would be that different from younger adults. Um, I was reassured by the, uh, the, the answer to the questions about reactogenicity among 18 to 25 year olds. Um, and even if there is a little bit more reactogenicity among younger adults or 16 to 17 year olds, that those aren't severe infections. So, um, and, and, and I want to sort of support what Dr. O'Leary and Kimberlin said, the, the impact of the pandemic on 16 to 17 year olds has been profound. Um, and it's not just getting COVID, but it's the impact of being out of school, the psychological impact it's been really hugely impactful for, for adolescents, not to mention the spreading to others. So I would um, favor including 16 to 17 year olds in the recommendation and favor the benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Slavji. Dr. Sanchez. Hi, Jose, thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can, yes, we can. Great, perfect, finally. Um, so I, I also want to say that I, feel strongly that the balance um, in terms of the desirable effects is far outweigh any undesirable effects. And I also want to re-echo what has been said about the 16 and 17 year olds, because they were included in the trial. They, um, they were randomized. They were part of the assessment and they should, and that group should not be penalized for not having huge numbers like the rest. But still, you know, there were 283 enrolled. And as we face this pandemic, I think that um, it, I would favor including them um, in terms of, um, you know, future administration if, if, if it is approved. I also want to comment, one last comment from before is that I know that, um, the, that there is, in, that they will be looking at pregnant women, but I also feel strongly that uh, lactating women is also extremely important because we need to also um, assess whether women who are breastfeeding should receive the vaccine or not. And I think that looking at effects in the in the baby who is being breastfed is also important and as another category, not just pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alt. I thought about Dr. Sanchez's comments after he made them at the last meeting, and this was alluded to earlier, so I'll just expand on it. It's kind of hard to come up with a biological mechanism where it gets through the mother's body, through the breast, through the child's stomach to cause a problem with breastfeeding. The, the only thing I thought of after his comments was, you know, some women may have a claim to increase in their milk supply because of or or that type of thing. But, uh, and compared to the risk of, of respiratory disease and COVID, that might not be a terrible risk. Doc, Dr. Alt, you're fading, you're fading away. Um, we can't hear you, that latter part of your... I, I was saying that compared to the risk of COVID, some transient decrease in the milk supply due to maternal fever probably would not seem like a big risk. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the uh, voting members? Liaison, uh, would you care to comment also? Um, we have uh, Dr. Lee, I see your hand is back up. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on what Dr. Alt mentioned and maybe ask uh, my obstetrics colleague this question, which is, um, do you have any thoughts about uh, postpartum vaccination uh, and the timing of that? As far as how quickly postpartum you would like to give the vaccine? 
Yes. Is there any sort of uh, natural interval in which there's any, like, you know, at the time of delivery or, and I realize perhaps like ACOG and SMFM may have, uh, be weighing in on this, but I just was curious if there's any um, pathophysiologic reason, because I agree with you on the breastfeeding issue, on the breastfeeding issue. And so my question was really around, is there really any concern that that would occur when somebody has delivered? I cannot think of a pathophysiological reason uh, to, to give a recommendation about timing. With the possible exception, you know, there is a little bit of data, and Denise Jamison may have brought this up because she's the author of that to the COVID group, that women remain at risk for respiratory illnesses like pneumonia, influenza pneumonia, for several months postpartum higher than the baseline. And we found that in the 2009 pandemic. So whether that will turn out to be true for this respiratory pathogen, it's probably too early to know. Uh, so, yes, I wonder if giving it in that immediate postpartum period would not be a bad idea. We do a lot, you know, we do the MMR vaccine for people who are not immune to rubella in that time. Uh, we, you know, we've done a lot of things in that 48-hour period. People might be in the hospital. So, yes, that might be a good time. But, the, again, we don't usually give vaccines that have a 10 or 20 percent rate of fever, uh, you know, in that time frame, so that would be the only caveat I could think of off the top of my head. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Dr. Eckhart. Yes, hi, um, I'm Dr. Eckhart, I'm the ACOG representative, and I just want to reinforce also what Dr. Alt said, that, you know, we do have good data that other viral illnesses uh, are more impactful in the postpartum period than in women that are beyond the postpartum period, uh, likely because of the fatigue and all the other risk factors that go with being postpartum. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that data. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Freihofer. Uh, Sandra Freihofer, American Medical Association. Um, I greatly appreciate um, all these comments about pregnant women, and I am really look forward to this DART study that the um, that the uh, sponsor is going to do. And um, remember that healthcare personnel are in this phase 1A, so one of the first groups to be vaccinated, 75% of, he of the healthcare workforce are female. So we're talking about 330,000 healthcare personnel that could become pregnant or might be recently postpartum uh, at the time when these vaccinations are going to start. So if there's any way that they could maybe, you know, the study's been done, they just got to get it all together and get this information out to us. If we could get it by the end of December instead of the first quarter, it would be so wonderful. We need something to look at. This is a new vaccine platform. We have women um, that need this for all the reasons that have been mentioned, but we want to make sure it's safe and we want to make sure we do no harm. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Romero, this is uh, Dr. Cohn. I just want to um, uh, respond quickly by saying uh, we uh, will have um, additional ACIP meetings whenever there are new data to um, inform our current policy, uh, regardless of, of whether or not that data suggests we need to change uh, our recommendations or not. We will make sure that we have an opportunity to review that data publicly as soon as uh, it's available. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Um, yes, uh, I believe the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and ACOG have been meeting to discuss this. I wanted to give them a chance to share with the group what their thoughts are on COVID vaccine. Dr. Eckert? Yes, yeah, thank you. I think that ACOG has uh, issued a statement uh, to ACIP and publicly, and as well as reiterated it last week on at the INVAC meeting, that we support um, allowing pregnant women to have a conversation with their providers based on their risk-benefit ratio of, for instance, the, the risk of them acquiring the virus based on their job, the prevalence in their community, their own health risks, and working with their provider to make an informed decision. Uh, ACOG is planning and working hard to have information available to providers uh, as soon as we can 
after the EUA and ACIP make their decisions um, to try to help our providers. But we are advocating for pregnant women to be able to have a choice to get this vaccine, provided the EUA allows for that. Uh, and we are hoping to equip providers and pregnant women with it, as much information as we can in order to make those decisions. Thank you. Thank you. I, this is Kevin Alt. I think the only thing I would add is that, you know, for the past 10 or 15 years, uh, Dr. Eckert, Dr. Riley, and I have been part of groups that ACOG and ACIP kind of try very hard to make sure all of our recommendations are congruent. And I think we're going that direction now. So I think we have been on the same page in the past and will continue to be. Thank you. Are there any more comments? And if people have, um, if people's hands are still up from their prior question, if you could lower them, that would be great. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Good, Dr. Freihofer, your hand is still up. I just want, very good, I just wanna make sure. Okay, um, so uh, we don't wanna prolong the meeting just to prolong it. Um, if there are no other questions, um, then I, I think we've concluded. I wanna make, uh, a reminder that tomorrow we will have another uh, emergency meeting of the ACIP. Um, you received, uh, members uh, have received invitations uh, for that. Um, and um, yes, and, and uh, you should have already received that. Um, Dr. Cohen, has word gone out to the liaisons and everyone else? Uh, no. Public notice already? So Dr. Ramirez, apologies. Um, we, we will ah. only, uh, we will only uh, definitively have a meeting tomorrow. Um, if FDA issues an authorization uh, before tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we do anticipate uh, that that is likely, um, so please be prepared, and we will send out um, invitations to the liaisons to have a uh, placeholder. We would, um, we're scheduling that meeting to start at 11 a.m. Um, and continue until 3 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and there will be a public comment session scheduled during that time. And so we will not be able to officially announce any sort of um, shift from Sunday to tomorrow um, until uh, we hear more from the FDA. Um, but please um, plan for potentially either day having a meeting. Very good. Forgive me for uh, doing a false start on that. Very good. Uh, so um, all I, there are no other uh, comments or questions. I want to thank um, everyone, uh, the presenters, for doing an outstanding uh, job of uh, uh, preparing their material and presenting to us. Um, and uh, thank you, all of you who, uh, who participated with your active questions and, and, and comments. Um, thank you. I think we've uh, covered the topic well. So uh, without uh, saying any more, um, if I had a gavel, I would gavel us out, but consider yourself gaveled out and we will see each other whenever the uh, EUA is issued. Thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.